Okay, I talked about this briefly, and I'll just say that when I started doing literacy 15 years ago, I took the job because I happened to be in the market for a job at the time, and I thought, I love to read, so that would be a good place for me to work. And so I thought, I wonder why there's a literacy program for what can there be in this county? A hundred people who don't know how to read well? I mean, I had a lot to learn, didn't I? <laughs> so that was the first thing I did was delve into what's adult literacy and, and did a lot of reading. But I think one of the things was good was I was doing this without a lot of direction, so I didn't know what you could and couldn't do. So I just started going to meetings all over the place. I, I loved what you said because that's what I do. I go to meetings and meetings and meetings because meetings is where you meet people and where they hear about what you do and where you end up with funding. Um, so I went to a lot of meetings and one of the first things that, was, that came out of that was getting into a one-stop job training center. That was really where a lot of the relationships I still have started there. So that was a wonderful entrance into um, meeting people, meeting organizations, and them meeting us. Uh, so you can see what we've come a long way since the beginning days and have learned a lot. Um, and one of the things I learned is a true partnership is not just they make referrals to you. And I think there's a lot of people who think that, that they go out and say, I'm going to find this partner who will refer people to my program. Uh-uh, that's not enough. Because you have something they need, they need to pay for it. And that's been the model that we've had from day one. If you want us to come into your business and provide literacy, if you want us to provide literacy for your um, you know, welfare clients or um, people seeking jobs or wh wherever it is, if they want literacy, then they have to give me the money to provide it. And I've had that attitude and people have said, okay, how much do you need? What will it cost me? So I think we give away our lemonade way too much. Now, the person on the street who comes into our program never pays. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the people who want your services brought to their location or to their clients. That's the people who need to pay. So you p you've got to plan who are these partners going to be that I'm going to work with. And so some of the questions that I would ask myself is, who needs our services? One of the people I figured out needed our services was welfare. So one day, I'm in this one-stop job training center, and they had an open house. And the director of welfare came to our, see our little bitty office, 600 square foot office. And so I got to talking to him, and I said, your the people you serve need what we have, and we would, we would like to contract with you to provide that service. He said, write me a one-pager about what you think you could do, and then I'll get back to you. So I did, and a week later, I had a $100,000 contract from Welfare to serve their clients, and it was just because I had a conversation, happenstance, with the director of the Community Services Agency. So. I ha still have that contract. It's grown a little bit. Not as much as I would like, but it's grown. Um, and we've had that contract for 10 years. One of the things that happened because we were in this one stop was we met middle management. That's very important. What, guess what happens to government workers? They retire really early sometimes, okay? So you have these middle management people who move up and become those new directors. And so we have forged relationships with all these middle management people as well because we know someday they're going to be the ones deciding whether or not we keep our money. So we are very good also at maintaining those relationships. Okay. So I ask who, I ask what can they do, who needs us. I also ask where. I don't think you should expect everybody who's going to be served by you to come to your program site. One of the most successful things we've done is we've become a contractor who goes wherever they want a class. We will provide a teacher, you will buy the books, you will provide the space, and we will provide a teacher. And for that, we get paid a contract. And so we have uh, sites in school schools, we have sites in family resource centers, we have, we're in probably 15 different places 
throughout our county. And that's because we are not afraid to take our service to them. Some of my staff have to drive SUVs because they have crates of books and files and, you know, that they have to crate around from site to site. One of my, one, I have to tell you the story. One of my instructors ended up at the wrong site one day. She forgot where she, that she was supposed to be across town, and so she was late, and she was embarrassed because she was late. But, so, but they will go wherever they need to go to provide that service. So you ask, where does it need to happen? Why does it need to happen there and how? And then, as the woman said um, this, mor this afternoon, <laughs> I've been up since 4, this afternoon, and as you said, um, you, you just make a partner. You just go after until you get them. And I'm going to tell you a story of how we did that. You figure out who, and then you figure out how am I going to make them my partner. Um, make sure it's consistent with your objectives. You don't want to get off mission. And I think you have to be careful that just to chase money, you don't go somewhere that you don't need to go. So you, you have to do that. You have to be strategic about your partnerships and make sure that those people that you're partnering with have a good reputation because you don't want them to tarnish yours by being their partner. So you have to do some things like that. Um, but you can make almost anyone your partner with persistence and creativity. And uh, the reason is nonprofits right now especially, have a great opportunity to become the provider of service. Why? Because government can't afford to hire new workers. It's costing too much. So they can contract you to provide a service that they can't afford to provide because they can't afford to hire the staff. So that's true of all. A lot of nonprofits in our county are benefiting from that. And I'll tell you, in spite of our economic times, our income was the highest this past year it's ever been, and I think it will be just as high this year. And that's because we are stepping in where other places are stepping out. Our school districts stopped doing adult education. So people still need it. People still want it. So they're asking us to do it because we're not government. We can do it cheaper. So I think you need to see that you have a unique role, and you need to see that people want what you can provide. So you are an attractive service to them, and, and know that about yourself. Um, I'm going to tell you briefly, and then I'll go into some of these, but when I said that you can make a partner with anybody, if you're persistent enough, I'll just tell you a story about that. I wanted to partner with our economic development. What I actually wanted and still don't have, but someday I will have, is a workforce training center that's really workforce training. We did have a one-stop for a while, it was a lot about drug addiction and mental health, so because they had the money at the time. So it went by the wayside because it got too off mission with that. So I wanted to have a one-stop that was truly job training and have literacy as a key component of that. I still want that. So I met the new director of develop or the economic development director for our county, which was hired. And my board president and I got a meeting, and we went in, and we said, this is what we need, this is what we want, this is why literacy is important, had a big fa a fact sheet on literacy, all that stuff. And he was like, you know, I agree with you, this is important, but this isn't going to happen right now. Okay. <laughs> so he offered us a couple of little bones, we'll help with this, we'll help with that, but no money, no space, no nothing I wanted. So we were like, okay. So... A couple years later, um, a new his uh, person over the workforce, um, what do we, you know, like unemployment office. It's called Alliance WorkNet. But that person changed, so I went to the new one and I said, got a meeting with him and went through everything that I wanted to do. And and I did in this case start out ref with referrals. And I said, why don't you just refer people to this new center we just opened? We actually need people to go there. We want to build our clientele. So we started a referral system. But six months later, we were so busy, I said, I'm sorry, we can't serve your referrals anymore. And he said, how much will it cost me? So we gave him an hors d'oeuvre, and he liked it. So now we still have a contract with them for $100,000 a year. Um, welfare department, I've already talked about employment agency. Family resource centers, that's one of our biggest growth areas right now, family resource centers. They get money from different 
sources, but they are needing to provide literacy, GED, um, family literacy kinds of things. So they contract us to come in and do that for their clients. English is a second language. Um, so we go in and do that at their site. What's wonderful about them is they often also provide childcare and transportation. Haven't those been our big issues for years? Like we don't, oh, we, people want those things from us and we can't provide them, but they can. So it's been wonderful partnership. Sheriff's Department and Probation Department, we also provide services in the jail. So one of the things I'm gonna suggest is sometimes you can combine those little pots of money that you have and I remember the day I was like a light bulb went on and I went, oh, I have family literacy money here from the, from, you know, the federal government, we had Title II, and I have some school districts with family literacy money, and I have people over here who wanna buy children's books, and I can just combine all of those and do one program with them and really do it well. And voila, we did. So we, we had at one time 10 family literacy programs, we still have five. And we just get our funding and we put it all together to make a good program. So, you know, that is another thing you can do. Don't always think you have to have one funding source for one program. You can really mix it up. But when you do that, you do have to make sure the funding source allows it and they keep good records. And we have time cards that they have like five programs they can work at one time <laughs> and put their time on different um, programs. You have to be able to break it out with your financial software and all those things. All those things have to be considerations in doing that, but you can do it. Um, also, I found you needed a middle layer of management, which I, I was trying to run five family literacy programs, our whole agency, and do fundraising. And my husband said, you gotta stop it. You need a family literacy director. And I'm like, <sighs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a part-time one and now I have a full-time one. So you do sometimes have to have that person to run the program to do it well. So think about that. Um, and another thing that I found was everybody wants outcomes. So what do we do? We have, we have certain measurements we take and we use them for every single funding source. So you're not, well, as much as we can. Sometimes we have to do something a little different. But that way, you're not measuring a bunch of different things for a bunch of different people. You're measuring the same things for everybody. And it just makes it so much simpler. Um, and one thing I'm gonna say is, diversity is the reason we have been successful. It is the reason I think people are surviving now, is they are not dependent on one single source, or even two, we had three when we started, when I came, and we have 15 now. So. You really need to get lots of different kinds of funding, and that's some examples of what you need to look at. So if you lose one, you're not going, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? I'm losing 90% of my funding. That should never happen to you. You should never let that happen, where you're that dependent on one single source or even two single sources of funding. And that is all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you.